The SEC slate of games rolls on as Georgia heads to Austin, Texas this Saturday night to take on the Texas Longhorns. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we're moving on to Texas for us. Uh, obviously a huge matchup. It's going to be a top 10, two teams in the country. Um, a lot of respect for Sark. You know, I've gotten to know Sark really well over the last couple of years. We take a trip every uh, every year together and really enjoyed getting to know him and have a lot of respect for the job he does. I mean, the most complete team um, that we've seen or faced uh, this year and probably in multiple years. When you look at what they're doing defensively, offensively, and special teams, they are clearly um, one of the best teams in the country uh, with what they do. You've got a great quarterback, great defense, great scheme. Should be a great matchup. And this is really what you come to Georgia to play in these moments. Once again on the road, um, going to a place that I've, I've never been. I don't I assume none of our players um, have ever been there either for a game. So it should be uh, exciting. Great TV and uh, looking for an opportunity for us to get better because that's the, the most important thing is can we show – some kind of consistent improvement and in, in, in play more consistent as a team. That's our goal. So with that, I'll open it up. Yeah, Coach, you mentioned Coach Sarkeesian. Just how difficult is it to prepare for him as a coordinator and Coach Flood as well? And what is something that they do that consistently causes problems that you've seen? Well, they're balanced. And they, they do a great job of uh, putting you in conflict in terms of run pass, play action, turn your back to the ball. I mean, they, they, they can take shots. They got really good wideouts to take shots with. Um, you know, I think they lost a couple backs uh, maybe in preseason camp, and I thought, like, okay, well, they're not going to have – well, <laughs> these two backs they got are really good. And I'm like, man, I'm watching them against Mississippi State, who I'd seen them against uh, – you know, last week while we were watching Mississippi State, I was really impressed. And then against Oklahoma, they even got better. So there's not like there's the, these weaknesses. They're big, physical up front on defense and offense. They're built around the offensive and defensive lines. And that, that when you look at his record and you say, look at his record while he's been there, every year it's improved. Well, the trenches improved every year. And, and they're for real in the trenches. They've got really good players, and they're built like an SEC team. And it's hard to prepare for him because he knows what he's doing. Def I mean, offensively, he's – be really different in terms of what he makes you adjust to. Well, yeah, that's interesting because it's it's like I said in the preseason. When I looked at Texas, I had no issue putting them in as a top tier, like a tier one team in the SEC this season. And then when they started to get into fall camp and then run up to the season, they did lose a running back or two, one to a season-ending injury. And I, I – was guilty, I guess, just like maybe Coach was, of looking at that and going, okay, maybe they don't have the depth. Maybe that's not going to be something that we have to be as concerned about. He just told us, looking at the tape, it appears that there's no drop-off. Now, I haven't watched uh, tape, obviously, the way Coach has, so uh, I'm going to take his word at that, that they're that good. I have heard rumblings, though, that they're although their backs, especially their second back, has looked good – they people aren't sure if that was based on the kind of competition that they were playing or if he actually is that good and he might be so that's on the table also and according to coach it looks like it is so the one thing you know about a Sarkeesian team is they are going to challenge you in scheme you know as I just stated that Texas has come into the league as a tier one team in terms of talent especially along the lines of scrimmage the question just simply becomes matchups right are made up by that's what dictates the game right um matchups make fights styles make fights so is georgia gonna be able to force texas into the kind of fight that they want to have or is texas going to be able to dictate the action against the georgia bulldogs and the other key point there is just what kirby said about having to continue to improve and how that was the focus and the goal of this team and to play up to their ability. That seems to be the thing that the dogs are chasing more than any other thing this year, consistency and being able to play up to the level that they believe they can play. I'll say this, this would be a fantastic week for Georgia to sort of figure that out and have everything come together because it's going to be uh, every bit as difficult as traveling to Alabama was earlier this year for the dogs and they have to show up ready and do the things necessary to not beat themselves just to give them a chance to win against Texas on Saturday night.
that note, how would you assess how your pass rush has done in recent weeks in terms of affecting and impacting the opposing team's quarterback? I don't know if you're referencing to something. I don't. I don't know because I don't know stats. I really. Do. We just don't. I don't look at it. I look at it game to game, and um, I think when we rush four guys, we do a really good job of getting home. We mix it coverage and pressure. Go back to Auburn, we, we ran some five and six man pressures. Somebody, one of those announcers before the game last week said that we were the highest five, six man pressure rate we've ever had since I've been here. I don't know the true uh, calculations of that. Sometimes people chalking those up don't know a guy rushing from a guy standing at the line that has the back. So I don't know if that's accurate, but we didn't do that necessarily last week because of the style of play they have. So we dictate off the offense what they do. And um, I'm pleased when with our rushers, our best rushers have been rushing well uh, when they're out there. And, and you know, I hope that we can affect the quarterback in some kind of way to impact the game, regardless of which week that is. That's kind of interesting because Kirby came off the hip and said, look, I don't know what you're referencing here. So I'm not sure if he's just sensitive to that or if he was just blanketly saying listen, I, I'm just going to tell you how I look at it, right? I don't look at it as how we're doing on the season. I look at it as how did we do this last game. And based off of what he's seen, he seems to think that they're doing pretty good. Now, I spent a lot of time in the offseason talking about the outside linebacker core, how they might use that group, how they could bring pressure with the interior linebackers uh, at times. I spent time talking about twists and stunts that the defensive line might use and ways they could generate pass rush because when you looked across the front you didn't have a guy other than maybe a healthy Michael Williams that you pointed to and said okay that guy can win uh you know in a pass rush situation we knew that Jalen Walker had the ability but we didn't know exactly how they were going to use him this year now over the course of the season we've seen Jalen Walker blitz we've seen CJ Allen blitz we've seen corners uh come in we've seen safeties come with pressure uh, and we have seen some push from that interior defensive line, primarily uh, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, who has become a force. Prior to the year, I was very excited because I thought the way they were going to use Michael Williams would be so chaotic and disruptive for defenses that it would really impact the game. We saw that against Clemson prior to him getting hurt. This past week against Mississippi State, I saw Michael Williams put his hand in the dirt in a three technique, which is over the outside shoulder of the guard, and uh, get after the passer in a pass rush situation. If Williams is healthy, that, just like we saw this past weekend, gives you the opportunity to put Williams inside where he can just win in a pass rush situation and at the same time have Jalen Walker up on the line of scrimmage as a pass rusher, have uh, Ingram Dawkins up there as a pass rusher, and then mix and match with any of the other guys that you want to put out there. Plus, you still have Damon Wilson off the edge. You still have Gabe Harris off the edge. And with these middle linebackers at that point, you think you don't have to rush them. I guess I say all that to say, Williams' injury has really impacted Georgia's ability to do what they want to do in the pass rush game. If Michael Williams is more healthy, and I think I heard Kirby say he's at 85% this past weekend, you could watch him until he's still not fully healthy. If he's closer to 100% and you can mix and match, create chaos, using Captain Chaos in various positions along the line of scrimmage, and then have the ability to turn loose Jalen Walker, uh, Damon Wilson, these guys to go get the quarterback, then Georgia's going to do better in the pass rush game. And as a Georgia Bulldog fan, I'll say it again, this is the week you want to be able to do that. You need to be able to get after Quinn Ewers or Arch Manning or whoever's playing quarterback for the uh, Longhorns. Trust your ability to contain their run game. Go get that quarterback in the pass rush uh, and speed up his clock, maybe force a turnover, something like that. There is no better week for all these pieces to start to come together than right now for Georgia. Let's hope that they're more healthy and that they're going to be able to play the way I just described against Texas. If so, that would be a huge deal for the Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, Kirby, do you have an update on Branson coming off of Saturday? Yeah, so Branson has a, a MCL. I don't know how many weeks it'll be. He will not be available this week. Um, 
you know, forecasting it out is impossible because the MCL is one of the ones that has to heal itself. Um, so we've had MCLs in the past, anything from, you know, two weeks to three weeks. I, I, I don't know what it's going to be, but he is he's going to be okay. Um, it's just a matter of getting back. And it was the not, it was not the same uh, leg injury that he previously had. You know, it was different. Well, that's some good news because nobody wanted to see Branson go down and then not be able to return to the game the other day. Uh, I was concerned just because of the way it looked when it happened. I, you, there was nothing that was obvious, but I was afraid that it may have been the same leg um, and potentially the same injury. Um, so I'm thrilled to see that that's not the case. I mean, nobody ever wants a player to be hurt. I'm just really happy that Branson's back. And it has just been a tough row uh, for him this season to find his groove. And just when you think he's about to find it, this happens. So, uh, thankfully, it looks like he's going to be okay. The coach said two to three weeks. I've seen it take as long as four uh, for an MCL. But that would depend on schedule and whether you need that player and that kind of thing. So, um, here's just wishing Branson the very best. I hope he gets back sooner rather than later. And back to 100%. Because, again, I just can't wait to see him find his stride and have the kind of season that I'm sure he wished and every Bulldog fan wishes he was able to have right now. Kirby, have you had a chance to go back and look at the incident uh, in the Mississippi State game, the shoving? Have you had a chance to call Coach Levy and perhaps yeah. even Van Buren himself? Yeah, absolutely, I have. And I'm glad you brought that up because after y you guys said that in the uh, – in the press conference, I went back and watched it, you know, and uh, didn't even realize that I had run into him. But I reached out to, to Levy that night and talked to him, and he said the kid was great. And then uh, yesterday I talked to Mike and told him, you know, I had no intentions or ill will towards him at all. It was, if you've ever been on the sideline in a game, it's pandemonium. It's really pandemonium when you're trying to change personnel and you only got three to four seconds to do it. And we were bad off in a bad personnel grouping against empty that we actually had messed up the week before. And so I was trying to get to Schumann to get that changed. But I reached out to the kid. He was great. He's a really good player. He's going to be a good player in this league. And he played better as the game went on against us. All right. So I'm glad Kirby answered that head up. He didn't run from it. He was eager to answer the question because clearly in today's world, people on social media are going to make it whatever they want it to be. With that said, when I watched it, and to me, it was painfully obvious exactly what was happening. And it was exactly what Kirby said it was. I tweeted as much right after it happened. I think my tweet was something like, if you think this is anything other than a coach extremely focused on doing whatever the thought is in his mind right now, and it was to get to his DC and relay some information here, Glenn Schumann, then you are absolutely misreading this, taking it out of context, because it could have been a Bulldog player there. Hell, it could have been a referee. It almost was. It could have been anything. He had a purpose, a goal, a message that he was trying to deliver, and it just shook out the way it shook out. So anybody who thought this is anything other than exactly what Kirby said it was right there, again, you are just trying to push a narrative drive an agenda, if you know the game and you watched it with just clear eyes, it's obvious what was happening right there. So hopefully this will put this to bed. I doubt it will, but the player himself said it's fine. The coach said it's fine because they know, because they're on the sideline, they get it. All right, so let's move on. Coach, uh, Quinn's obviously their starting quarterback. Arch Manning has played a couple games this year. When you go into preparation for a quarterback, how much does that impact knowing that one has played you know, multiple games this year as opposed to just someone being a starter consistently throughout the season? I don't really understand what you're saying. Do we prepare for two quarterbacks? How do you go about that when you've seen tape and a lot of film on a backup as well? How much does that go into a game plan knowing that two quarterbacks have a lot of tape? No, I, I don't. It doesn't change how we prepare. Now, they're different style quarterbacks, but they're not really different style quarterbacks. They're both really good. And I'll say this: you watch the games that Arch played. He played really well. He did some really good things. I mean, look at his numbers. He played. Uh, I mean, he comes out first couple of plays against Mississippi State, uh, ripping it and firing it in his first SEC play, and, and played really good. But I, you know, 
Quinn's a great player, and they got a great quarterback. They got a great situation because they've got two guys that really both are capable of winning and playing well. Yeah, so the the nugget right there, the central part, was essentially Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning are the same player. Uh, you could argue maybe based on what we saw this season so far that Arch might be a little bit better with his feet, um, but I don't know that I would argue that. I think maybe that was more of a uh, just who he happened to be playing against at the time. So, again, these are the same quarterbacks, so it's not going to change the way Georgia schemes up Texas. Um, the – in terms of just the basics of how they're going to approach it. Now, if Arch were to make his way into the game, you might see Georgia go with some more exotic looks to try to fool him, but I doubt you're going to be able to fool Quinn Ewers necessarily. The biggest thing about Quinn is you have to get after him and just like any quarterback, get him off the X. If you do that, then you can really sort of in, you know, mess up his rhythm, get into his head, that kind of stuff. So, and he is coming off an injury. So the more times you can hit him, and I mean within the whistles, completely legal, but the more times you can put a hat on him, you know, you think about those sorts of things if you're coming off of an injury. So I think that was a pretty straightforward question. Uh, if if you had uh, a guy back there who was a running quarterback, then yes, it might change your approach, but that's really not what Texas has right here. Hey, Kirby, what makes their defense elite? Size, speed, two best front guys. I mean, let's let's every every defense starts with train wreckers, big guys, physical guys at the point of attack that are hard to move. They got them. All right, they've got guys on the edge that are elite rushers. They got a, an elite player out of the portal. They went and got DB from Clemson, who's playing really good. I mean, like they patched up some holes they had, and they're the complete package on defense. They're really consistent. Like they're not like. They don't give up explosives. They're really good in the red area. they hard to run the ball on. I mean, the consistency you watch them play with, it reminds me of, you know, some of our better teams here, our best teams here. I'm like, man, they're, they're good on D. They're good on O. They're good on special teams. And they're playing at a high level. Well, Kirby, you're building a lot of confidence there in us fan base. We're making us wonder, uh, does Georgia have a chance this week? Because Texas, the way he just made that defense sound – and it's like they're world beaters. Um, from what I've seen against Texas, they look good on defense. Um, the the questioner asked, he used the word elite. Kirby didn't shoot that down. So, I mean, Kirby gets paid to know what elite looks like. I guess I have to take his word for it there. Um, but if you are a Georgia offense, you're just sitting there going, hmm, how are we going to move the ball? Can we actually, you know, execute our run scheme? We haven't so far, not really. Will be able? Will the dogs be able to get separation uh, in the pass game? Will they be able to find the holes? Will the def or the offensive line be able to hold up against the pass rush to give our guys a chance to win down the field in the vertical passing game, which is what we all want to see. Remember, Georgia's throwing the ball like fifty six percent of the time this season, so they are a pass heavy offense. Execution will be critical for Georgia along the offensive line on the road against this Texas pass rush if the dogs are going to have any success uh, moving the football against what Kirby is arguing is a very, very good Texas defense. Now, I've heard other people say that that Texas back end hasn't really been tested. Georgia has the ability to test them, but only – if the offensive line can execute correctly, right, make their communications, don't cut people loose on the pass rush, execute the blocking scheme in the run game, this week, maybe more than any other week this season, that offensive line, they have to get it done. Uh, Coach, uh, obviously you're pretty intense on the sideline. That's, it it might have lent itself on that particular thing. I think one of y'all's tenets is, is composure. Yeah. Uh, how would you rate yourself on sideline 
during games as far as composure goes? Depends on what happened. <laughs> but, I mean, and realistically, that, I think that's something that Jackson Meeks and I talked about last year. It was great because we had a fumble or something on a punt return, and I was upset with Ladd, and, and Jackson came over and said, composure card, coach, composure card. But sometimes that is, the, you know, there's there's an intentional look. You, you got to be intense. You got you to know what you got to do. You got to understand that. But that's important. Our players talk about that all the time. And I, I think we had several penalties in that game that had a chance. To, to, to lose composure or they had a chance to lose composure that were teaching moments too, whether that's Damon or Chaz's or a London had a play where you know he had a drop and came over there. I think those are great teaching moments for players and um, try to do a good job helping them with that. That's pretty interesting. I mean, Kirby stepped right up there. It's funny that they would call him on. It's a fair question. I think he answered it pretty well. I mean, he's like, listen, there's a difference between me making sure that we're executing correctly and me flying off the handle and just acting a fool on the sideline. Uh, and in the situation this past Saturday was clearly he was trying to relay information so that they could execute correctly. Uh, but then he turned it and gave the example of, whereas if a player uh, makes a penalty that's silly or fumbles the ball and needs to calm down so they can make a good play the next opportunity. That's what the composure part card means right there. And I think that's pretty cool that he took just a second to break that out for us. Yeah, Kirby, I guess one, did you notice anything about your secondary that you maybe did notice during the game when you went back and watched the tape? And two, just what challenges does Texas's offense present with the, with the deep shots you were talking about earlier? It's different because the deep shots, I mean, we're talking about two distinctly different offenses. But when, when you watch the tape, when we played correctly and used the right technique, we played well. We did not win every ball. Jonel Aguero is a great example. He covered the guy exactly like he was supposed to, and the guy made a great throw and a great catch. We're going to take that. We're going to say, you know what? We're not going to win every battle. We're not going to win every 50-50 ball. But we're going to try to win more than we lose. But when you don't cover someone, period, as a coach, you're going, what is wrong here? Like, like we didn't cover the guy. We had bad eyes. We looked in the backfield. Things that you harp on every day, they happen. That's what offenses do. They try to give you eye candy and try to get you looking at the wrong thing. We have to remove those, right? But the Texas presents a completely different because you know they'll have you sitting in the line of scrimmage because you think it's a run and they ran right by you. They'll have you looking at a motion and 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 you don't see the guy running down the field past you. They got great speed on the perimeter. They got great size. So they present maybe a different challenge than Mississippi State, but a challenge. Okay, so there's a little bit to clean up right here now. Uh, I'm absolutely with Kirby Smart. That play, I'm sure you all remember it. Aguero got hit for a big ball down the le left sideline. And that's the same argument that we have made in the past about Malachi Starks or Dalen Everett or even Julian Humphrey, where the guys, you play it as well as you can possibly play it, and the other guy just makes a play. That's football. That's why uh, you compete. But when you compete against top two athletes, sometimes they make a play. So that's one category. The other stuff that he's talking about there were those two touchdowns on arrow routes where um, it, it, the handle for my channel is a damn beast, okay? That's partly because it comes from a phrase that I grew up listening, being around the game, hearing coaches scream and yell when players bust uh, an assignment. And the way that would echo across the, the practice fields was like, that's a damn bust, a damn bust. And that's what Georgia had a couple times against Mississippi State. And I told you guys coming into that game that what they do is different and the way they do it is different. And Georgia got bit a couple times. I said Mississippi State can put points on the board. Now, there are casual fans among us who don't want to hear any of that. But that was the reality. I told you it was coming and it happened. Here is the danger. Georgia could outscore Mississippi State. Texas, he mentioned eye candy. Well, that's because of Steve Sarkeesian and the offense he runs. And it is littered with eye candy, enough to give you eye cavities. It is going to be a window dressing game for the Texas Longhorns most of the time. And Sarkeesian is very, very good at it. So if Georgia had issues against Mississippi State with eye discipline, looking at the right thing, reading your keys, boy, they got a mountain to climb this week against Texas because that is all Texas is offensively in the passing game. Think about those really good Alabama offenses from his time there. Why were they so good? Scheme, 
eye candy. They would scheme their way open because of pre-snap movement. Think about Georgia, Munkin. When Georgia was at their very best, it was because of that pre-snap movement. You get into the matchup you want. You give other teams bad eyes through scheme and through formation, and then you capitalize on it with your playmakers. That's the challenge for this Georgia defense against Texas this weekend. And whew, I'm telling you, Kirby is stacking the deck high. If you're a Bulldog fan, just understand what they're about to get into. It is a big, big challenge. Kirby, in, I think in August you spoke about um, needing to build up the number of players capable of playing winning football and how you know the portal and everything was deteriorating. And I'm curious, does that at this point continue to be a challenge or an issue for this team, would you say? No, I wouldn't say that's a challenge or issue for this team. I think it's a challenge and issue for every team, uh, not relative to us, right? I don't think anybody, when, when I talk to my coaching peers and we share messages, I think everybody lacks the depth, depth maybe they had the year before. You know, maybe one year you're like, oh, I got a few more linemen than I had last year. But on the whole, there's not great depth, right? Our issues have really been inconsistency, not depth. And we've had some injuries in some spots. And we've got four or five starters out, depending on how you count a couple guys from, from, from injuries. But inconsistency, I would say yes. Uh, portal slash uh, depth, no. Not yet. I mean, we're just I – I would like to have more guys that can play winning football. I would like to have played more players by now. But we're looking at our snap counts, and they're higher than they've been years before for the starters. Why is that? We've been in tighter, tougher games. Yeah, so there's a couple of things there. There's that point he finished with, which is if you're in tighter games and you have to have your top-line guys on the field, they're going to play more. So that's that. And in the preseason, he had absolutely said – I need to get my guys ready early in the year because we're going to need them late in the year. We will see down the road if that lack of valuable playing time is going to come up to be a problem later down the road. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see because there are going to be moments where those younger players are absolutely going to be counted on to play. And hopefully they're taking good reps now so they'll be ready to go when the opportunity arises. The other thing he brought to, to bear there is it's not just Georgia, it's everybody. That's a fact. And it was one of those things that I heard people say when we talk about NIL and the transfer portal and all that. And they're like, well, it's going to even out the playing field because you're not going to have depth. That is something that has absolutely been borne out. Like it's proven. You can see it. Uh, a guy that may have been your number two or number three is now a number one for someone else. So not only are they a number one for that team and helping that team, if you happen to play that team, now you're essentially down twice because you don't have that player on your roster for depth. And now you have to play a guy that you thought was a pretty good player in the first place, which is why he was on your team. So those other teams are better, and that leads to parity. So uh, is that the overwhelming factor, the number one driver? No. But is it a reality of college football today across football at every level inside the NCAA? Yes, absolutely it is. And that is a lot of the reason, not the only reason, but that is a lot of the reason that a lot of these games between a lot of these teams that you think are supposed to be blowouts are not. That is the reason that teams that are you think are supposed to just handle another team, they can't because it's just more competitive. And in several occasions, those underdogs have just won outright. That is also part of this because if you're playing more snaps, you get more fatigued, and then obviously you can't be as good late in the game. I think it's going to force us to adjust everything, not just the way we look at seasons like a 12-game regular ski season and how many losses your team has, but it's also going to force you to look at everything in terms of statistically, how good is this defense versus our past defenses? Not as good. Does that mean it's bad? Or does that mean that even though we're not as good as we have been, we're still better than most? And that is a result of all this other stuff we're talking about here, where no one is going to be able to build the kind of depth that Georgia had a few years ago. And because of that, you're just going to see more inflated offensive numbers. I'm just looking at the defensive versus offensive there. That could probably flip the other way too. Um, but I, maybe we have to adjust more than just 
our concept of what a good season is based off win-loss records. Maybe it's more in terms of that's a really good defense, even though they might be giving up 30, 40, 50 yards rushing more now than they did before. That's still a top defense. At the end of the day, it all depends on how many games you win, but it's a big, muddy picture, but there are starting, we're starting to see it sort of flesh itself out a little bit and get a better understanding of what uh, the portal and NIL are doing to teams that maybe we haven't seen in the past. Kirby, when it comes to pass defense, what's the biggest metric that you guys look at to determine the success? For us, we usually do yards per attempt, including everything in that, you know, to see yards per attempt. And it's not as good as it's been in years past. We've had a couple, like, really good three, four years, you know. And uh, I think the Taiki, Kamari, Bullard has an effect on that because you got three players that are really good, drafted. you got to always have people stockpile behind it. We probably haven't played as well uh, at that position, and we have younger players. But for us, the metric is, like, <laughs> you have three or four incompletions and you give up a 10-yarder, well, you're okay there because you got 10 divided by – four whatever but when you give up a 75 yarder and a 77 yarder that's not good that's not we were historically around here we haven't given up massive explosives so and that's just following up on that previous point execution is a big deal and uh that's at every position on the field but when you have turnover and you don't have the the deep deep depth that maybe you're used to that also impacts execution when those younger players have to get into the game, which down the list a little ways could contribute to what he was just saying about how they measure these numbers defensively and and their pass defense and what it actually looks like this year. And the other piece other than NIL and the portal is when you have talented players the way Georgia does, and it just works out to where they are old enough to go to the league and enter into the draft and you happen to lose three top flight players out of one unit that's going to be impactful. Now that's not the only reason, but there is something to it. And it's fair for coach to point to that and say, we are working with what we've got. This is a good group, but they're young, they're learning. And when you lose that sort of experience, like we just lost, you're going to see it. So, I see a lot of people in my comments on my pages and they're like, this defense is awful. They're terrible or horrible. Those folks have no real understanding of what Kirby's talking about right there and what I'm trying to relay and, and explain. Uh, they just know the bottom line is Georgia gave up X number of yards because they're just looking at the box score. I mean, even if they watch the game, they'll verify what they thought they saw by looking at the box score without any real desire to understand how or why it's happening. Uh, obviously, if you want to win, you have to do better. But to just throw blanket statements and say this is this unit is awful because X, well, I mean, there's more to it than that. So if that's if that's the kind of fan you are and that's the kind of fan you want to be, okay. But I and a lot of people that are on this channel and watch my videos are not that kind of person. They want to understand why. Coach is trying to help you understand why. Coach, with the portal nowadays, you always it seems like you're going to come back around and see somebody that you, you had at some point. Bill Norton is playing yeah. for them now. What what can you say about his time here, and what are you seeing from him on tape and such? Bill Norton, what a great kid, man. This guy worked his tail off here and uh, worked really hard. And, you know, I, I go back to – I forget which year it was. It had to have been – three years ago or four years ago when he was his, one of his key roles was special teams, you know, and he played on our, our uh, field goal protection unit and was the best at doing it. We had, and he was a, you know, he was a backup defensive tackle and played some snaps, but that was his role. And I, I want to say uh, maybe the Ohio state game or one of the games we lost somebody and he had to go in and, and, and take over and, and play a role at that. And he did it with, with great pride. He was always, like positive and enjoyed practice and was fun to be around, funny guy. And now he's been, I guess, two places, you know, and uh, uh, he's playing for them and he's doing a really good job. He he subs in and rolls in as one of their uh, backup DTs. Now that's pretty cool little background story there on Bill. Bill came to Georgia as, a, as if I'm not mistaken, he was a five-star player out of Tennessee, uh, maybe the top rated player in the state that year. And he just couldn't get on the field at Georgia. He, you know, he just couldn't. Uh, and I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you why. I mean, there were some really big horses in front of him. Um, 
And even though Bill, you know, was a good player, he wasn't that good necessarily. So that just shows you that everything is relative. Uh, he went to, I believe it was UTSA uh, and spent a year. It was UTSA or UTEP. And now he's back over playing for Texas and contributing to that team. So that's a little bit of uh, background there for uh, for us dogs who've been here for a minute. And we actually know who these players are. That's funny. It's speaking of NIL, NIL in the portal. There's another example. Uh, yeah, their tight end, Helm, kind of really big game last weekend. What type of challenges he's present with his size and length? Well, first of all, he's a tremendous blocker. He's not a one-way tight end. You know, he's got great size. I mean, this guy's huge on film, but he's a great pass catcher. And the scheme that Sark has – Oh, I mean, they, they do a great job. It's not like they just say, hey, go out here and go one-on-one -on -one and get open. They're, they're sprinting out, throwing back. They're, 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 they're play action, boot naked. Okay, throw a screen off of it. Everything that you don't honor because you're thinking about another play, they got to play off of it that makes you honor him. And uh, he's a tremendous blocker. Uh, I think the quarterbacks are really comfortable with him. So when you get zone elements and holes in zones, they trust him to go to be at that spot and catch the ball. But – I wasn't aware of him going into the week because I had not really heard of him. And now watching tape, this guy's a really good player. And you're right, he had a big game last week. There you go, another weapon for Texas that Georgia fans have to worry about. Obviously, the coach is aware of it. He's worried about it. Uh, back to those good eyes, right? Be where you're supposed to be. Watch this guy. Um, and But more than that, it speaks to Sarkeesian and the scheme and the way he builds his plays and – uh, that is what Kirby was trying to make a point of right there, saying, listen, you might see this this motion, this flow. You might think it's this thing, but off of that, they build these other things into it, and they are taking advantage of it because they trust this young man at tight end. Now, before anybody jumps on here and says, I wish Georgia would do that, they absolutely do. So just know that. If they try to have, like, it, it, whatever the defense is playing – if defense is playing man, there are man beaters built into every play that's in the pass game, right? If they're playing zone, same thing. Zone beaters built in. At least one of the routes is something designed to beat whatever it is the defense is doing. So that is just another thing that good offenses do. That's But Sarkeesian, as we have said over and over and over, is very good at scheming his team into advantage and then having players that understand that and take advantage of it in game action. Yeah, what have you seen out of Michael Williams in recent weeks as he pushes through that ankle injury and tries to get out there and help you guys? I've seen just that. I mean, I, you don't see much out of him until the game. I think he had six or eight snaps against Auburn and 10 or 11 snaps uh, last uh, this last game, Mississippi State. So, I mean, he looked better to me during the week this past week, so the, the what we were able to do Auburn game was getting better to Mississippi State, and now we've gotten another week under our belt, and we're hoping that he's healthy and full and ready to go. But again, I don't know that until we get out there. But you don't, I don't get a great evaluation during the week because he's only been able to do some of the work. Yeah, and I, I talked about this earlier. If they can get a healthy Michael Williams back, it is a literal game changer for what Georgia can do in their pressure game when they're trying to get after the quarterback. And I'm not saying they have to run blitzes necessarily. I'm just saying him on the field allows them to, by formation, get their better players on the field when you are expecting a pass and then you can create havoc because those better players are on the field. So fingers crossed that Michael is getting better and that we're going to be able to see that in the game Maybe 20 snaps if we're really lucky against Texas. Yeah, Coach, you've obviously been familiar with Sark for several years now. How much have you seen him change now that he's kind of got the full reins of the operation again, <coughs> particularly as a play caller and a designer? Yeah, I don't know that he's changed as a play caller and designer. I, I, his elite ability is is to get players the ball. Like, that's what he's elite at because he's had really good wideouts before, and they, 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 they were really good. He's had really good backs and he found ways to get them the ball. He's had good tight ends like he has now, and he's finding them ways to get the ball. I mean, he, his offense is um, – it's, it's not – I mean, it is complicated because it has motion shifts and a lot of window dressing. 
but he gets back to the plays that he's going to run and he's able to be versatile enough to say, okay, I got this guy, I got to get this guy the ball. And some of the plays are like ours now where they're not built for one player. They're built for what does the defense do? I'm going to get it to my weapons. Um, and there, there's probably more similarities between the two offenses than some of these offenses we've faced. Oh, Kirby, thanks for making me right, man. That's awesome. I just sat here and shared with you guys everything he just said. And I love it when the coach backs me up. That's all I'll say about that. That's awesome. And I, I hope that's why you guys are choosing to watch this video. I hope that's why you're here. That's awesome. His overall stats, Quinn's, don't really jump off the page, but there's one thing he has, uh, I guess surprising more than Carson, is completion percentage. Uh, is that just, he just effective in that way, leading? He doesn't really care about the, you know, how they're scoring, but just the fact that they are scoring. I guess what jumps off the page when taking a look at Quinn as a leader for that offense? His awareness. Like, he, there's nothing that he sees he hasn't seen. You know, a quarterback, you get confidence by playing the position. You're not going to have some guy that just doesn't play and go out there and play great. He's played a lot of football. He's a really good athlete. He's been in Sark's system. I mean, I think the comparisons between he and Carson are so similar in terms of the kind of quarterbacks they are. They're both better athletes than people think. They both uh, have awareness of coverage, and they're really good in the pocket. I mean, this guy's taken off and hurt people running when he needs to, but he also can stand in the pocket and make all the throws and, and change the protection. So I've really been impressed with him, but that that was the case, you know, even last year when I saw him play. Got time for one more question? Yeah, so that that was kind of what I was saying earlier, that uh, he can hurt you with his legs, uh, maybe not quite as much as Arch, um, but then again, that's not his primary driver here. He's trying to run the offense uh, within the the parameters of what he's being asked to do, and and we all know it. Ewers is a re is a really good player. He's a really good quarterback. Um, his big thing has always been his health, and he couldn't stay healthy. But when he's right, he's very dangerous. Coach, just from a, an identity standpoint, what is the best best case scenario? I mean, every team is a little bit different, but what are you looking for this team to fulfill as as you grow it and the season progresses? I want to see them play their best game against Texas. I mean, simply stated, I mean, we have not played our best game. We have not put a complete game together. And that's what every coach's goal is, right? To, to, to play your best game moving forward. And th th that's what's going to be needed to go on the road at Texas and play. We, we, we got to play better. And that's, that's the only goal I'm thinking about right now is how we play this week. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it. Pretty straightforward. Kirby let you know what the deal is heading into Texas. Tall, tall task ahead of the Bulldogs as they head out to Austin next Saturday night for a primetime matchup where millions across the country will be watching. Certainly, everybody in the college football world. Enjoy the games. Until next time, go dogs. Tell them how about them dogs. That's what I told them.